okay and right away uh, he is a research scientist in the department of applied physics and applied uh, mathematics at columbia university and uh, his research areas uh, include uh, so called optical frequency comb generation in a silicon based uh, waveguides and micro resonators uh, coherent computing based on uh, degenerate optical parametric oscillation again in micro uh, resonators and parametric nonlinear interaction in photonic devices slow light and all optical signal processing using space time duality duality techniques so all uh, related to nonlinear uh, photonics and mostly uh, in, in the silicon and chi 3 process and Dr. Okawachi is the uh, recipient of the uh, 2007 uh, Tinge Lee Innovation Prize and uh, he has published more than 80 uh, peer-reviewed journal papers and co-inventor of uh, three patents and uh, he has served uh, as a program committee uh, technical program committee member uh, in several uh, uh, recognized uh, conferences in the area of optics and photonics such as clio fio uh, las scp and clio pacific rim and uh, also uh, he also contributed uh, he's, he has been contributing uh, for uh, reviewing uh, journal papers and so almost 26 peer reviewed journal papers he is contributing uh, for with his expert uh, review comments currently he is the associate editor of the uh, uh, optics letters so that is highly high impact factor uh, journal and uh, he is also vice chair of the optica ultrafras optical phenomena technical group and the chair of the integrated photonics technical group uh, he is an Optica Fellow and served as the 2017 uh, Optica Ambassador. So earlier it was the OSHA, Optical Society of America. Recently it has been uh, converted into Optica, known as Optica, so Optica Ambassador. And uh, he will be uh, talking, he will be presenting uh, today, as you see uh, the title, On-Chip Nonlinear Photonics. And in the panel uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Sudarshanan Srinivasan will be uh, uh, moderating. So you can, uh, whoever actually register participants and directly watching this, you can put up your questions. It can be interactive and uh, you can directly ask questions if needed. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dr. Sudarshanan will forward that question uh, to uh, Dr. Rossi. And uh, there is a three dots in the right hand side. There, if you click, there will be a Q and A uh, box will be there. There you can put up your questions. And other than uh, that, we have our uh, chief technology officer Arnav Goswami also there in the panel and the moderator already uh, there. And uh, I see also another one uh, uh, renowned engineer. Uh, I see uh, Vivek Raghunathan. Uh, he's also uh, there in the panel. Vivek, if possible, if you can uh, just, uh, just switch on your video, I think he can also participate uh, in the panel discussion while the Q&A session. And uh, yeah, with this, uh, I just uh, uh, hand over to uh, Yossi. Yossi, it is now, stage is yours. Uh, please entertain us for next 45 minutes to one hour. And then following that, we can have some Q&A session. I think uh, that is that would be more interesting, I guess. So, over to you, Yossi. Yeah. Great. Um, thank, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And, you know, thanks to everybody at uh, IIT Madras for uh, the invitation as well. Really excited to be here. Um, so, let me just share my screen. Can everybody see the, yeah. the, the slide? Okay, great. Um, okay, so, uh, so today I'll be talking about, you know, some of the I guess the research that we've been doing um, over the past like five, ten years or so on um, integrated uh, nonlinear photonics. Um, so this was work done at Columbia University um, in in uh, Alex Gaeta's lab um, in very close collaboration also with um, Michal Lipson's group also at Columbia. Okay, so um, nonlinear optics. So nonlinear optics is the the study of um, light matter interactions where the optical field is strong enough such that you can actually change the material properties. 
So on the microscopic scale, you can model this using a Lorenz atom model. So, you know, if you have a, um, an electric field that's incident on an atom, that, that actually result in an induced di dipole. And the restoring force um, that you can see here um, is a nonlinear function of the displacement of that electron. So this particular restoring force is related to the polarization. And um, you can solve for the polarization using a, a power series expansion, if you will. So if you take a look, you basically have this uh, second and third term here that correspond to uh, the second and third order nonlinearities. And those are essentially what will um, result in the generation of new frequencies. So for most of this talk, I'll be talking about uh, chi three nonlinearities in this case. And um, one of the, you know, the key nonlinear interactions that I'll be, I'll be mainly discussing today is um, parametric Fourier mixing. So um, Fourier mixing is a, again, a third order nonlinear interaction. In this case, two pump photons annihilate to create the signal and idler photon pair. Um, so in order to have very efficient uh, forward mixing process, you, you need two things. One is energy conservation, which effectively defines the frequencies that are involved. And then you have momentum conservation, or you know, I guess more known as phase matching. So typically in order to have um, you know, parametric gain, uh, you require operation where the group velocity dispersion is less than zero, which is the anomalous uh, dispersion regime. So uh, a key enabling uh, development for efficient nonlinear interactions is the implementation of a waveguide geometry, whether it's you know, an integrated or a fiber. So if you take a look at the nonlinear parameter or the nonlinear phase shift, um, you can see that it's linearly dependent on the power and also the interaction length. Um, and then you can also see it's inversely dependent on the area. So you know, if you compare to a focusing geometry in a bulk media, the waveguide can allow for a much longer interaction length which also you know, effectively helps to reduce the power requirements as well. <clears throat> so integrated photonics takes this even a step further. Um, there, there's been, you know, I, I guess if you, if you look, at, look back at the past 5, 10, 15 years or so, there's been a tremendous amount of um, advances in fabrication technology that has led to a development of you know, numerous photonic platforms for nonlinear optics. You know, including silicon, silicon nitride, um, aluminum nitride, lithium niobate. You know, the the list goes on, right? Um, so today I'll be focusing on silicon nitride. Um, so if you take a look at uh, uh, silicon nitride itself, the nonlinearity is actually pretty high. It's about ten times larger than that of silica glass. Um, and if you take a look at this waveguide cross section here, um, you have quite a high index contrast between the silicon nitride core and the the surrounding oxide cladding. So this, this contrast allows for a very tight optical confinement such that you can have you know, waveguide geometries that are sub, uh, sub wavelength in, in dimension. So not only does this mean that you can have very compact structures you know, with fairly sharp bends, um, but also this, this small um, waveguide area allows for an enhanced nonlinearity since you know, the effective nonlinear phase shift is inversely proportional to the, the area. So this was work that was led by um, uh, Xing Chen Ji from uh, Michal Lipson's group at Columbia. Um, so you know, again, this this is really a result of the the, the tremendous advances in fabrication and processing technology. Um, it's possible to now have silicon nitride wave guys with very low propagation losses of you know let, uh, about 0.4 dB per meter. So what this means is on, on this very tiny you know. Um, um, you know, few millimeter weight, uh, uh, chip chip dimension. You can have you know tens of centimeters of waveguide length to do you know efficient nonlinear optics, delay lines, and so forth. Um, uh, last but not least, um, again, this tight optical confinement leads to a very large contribution from the waveguide dispersion. So what this means is, what we can do is just by changing the waveguide cross section, um, you can access. You know a, a lot of different kind of dispersion profiles, and this is actually very critical for you know phase match nonlinear processes such as for mixing. So uh, here's the outline of my talk. Uh, so I'll start by talking about Kirkholms. I'll give a background, uh, talk about some of the work on silicon nitride and near IR, and also talk about some of our more recent work on synchronization. And then uh, switch gears and talk about uh, degenerate optical parametric oscillators. So these are all both in uh, silicon nitride microresonators. So um, optical frequency combs are defined as a spectrum of regularly spaced discrete lines. 
So you have two parameters that define this. One of them is the delta F or the comb spacing. And then you have the, the uh, FCO, which is the carrier envelope offset frequency. So by knowing these two parameters, you can effectively know the absolute frequency of all the different um, you know, frequency components that are generated. And you can, you can think of it as um, a frequency ruler for you know, a variety of applications. Um, and also because of the, 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 you know, the, the cone spacing, you can actually also create a, a direct link between, an op, um, between the optical and microwave domain. So uh, comb te technology has become quite mature over the past 10 years or so, and there's been numerous uh, applications that have come out of it, including uh, molecular spectroscopy, ultrafast ranging, optical frequency th synthesizers, atomic clocks, uh, communication, OCT, uh, microwave generation, and so forth. So there's also been you know, a lot of commercial development as well. Um, so there's been a lot of tabletop um, you know, commercial products that have come out, including Menlo System, Toptica, Imra, and so forth. Um, so in our research, what we want to do is take this very large you know, um, you know, tabletop kind of scale uh, frequency comb and make it into this you know, centimeter uh, footprint uh, so that we can, you know, realize a handheld uh, uh, a frequency comb source with applications, for example, in WDM or lab on a chip. So uh, Kerr comb generation typically relies on high Q micro resonators. The cavity free spectral range is typically in the range of 10 gigahertz up to a terahertz. Um, the process uh, relies on uh, forward mixing parametric oscillations um, initiated by a single frequency pump laser. So, you know, as the pump is tuned into the, the cavity resonance, um, the power builds up. And these, um, once the parametric gain exceeds the losses, you start getting parametric oscillation where you generate these sidebands. So with further power buildup, you can get high order forward mixing processes to occur that allow you to, you know, fully fill in all the resonances to generate this uh, Kerr uh, frequency comb. So there's been a lot of work done both uh, experimentally and theoretically on Kerr combs. Um, and um, for, for, for theoretical modeling, uh, you can use the Lugiato Lefebvre equation that's given here. Um, so the first term is the, the pump field. Um, you have the propagation and coupling losses here. And then uh, this delta naught is the pump cavity detuning. Um, and you have all the different orders of uh, dispersion and the nonlinearity here. Um, so here's a, a simulation of the comb generation dynamics. Uh, so this is uh, operating in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. So as you tune in, you start seeing these uh, primary sidebands form. This is also known as a Turing pattern. And then with more tuning, you transition into this chaotic, like uh, very noisy state. Um, so by, by further tuning the, the, the pump into resonance, you can actually transition into a, a multi-pulse state where the pulses start to annihilate. Um, so these, these uh, temporal pulses in this case are known as uh, dissipative crystallotons, and uh, they're stable localized structures that, that arise, arise between the balance between loss and gain and dispersion and nonlinearity. And then finally, you know, you, as you can see here, you can transition into the single soliton state where you basically have one pulse that is circulating in, uh, around that microresonator cavity. So, um, so the, the, the simulation I just showed basically is, uh, op again, operating in the anomalous group velocity dispersion regime. Um, so you can uh, basically um, realize this by engineering the cross-section of the waveguide such that you have this broad region of anomalous group velocity dispersion um, around the pump. And this, again, is a dissipate of cursed soliton. And, you know, th this is a, a specific kind of uh, solution to the, the Lugia favor equation uh, that arises due to the balance between the loss and the parametric gain, and also the balance between dispersion and nonlinearity. So, um, uh, so these, these, are, these are some of the, the platforms that have been actually demonstrated um, for Kirkholm generation. Uh, there's actually even more to this list that um, I haven't been able to fully, you know, fill it in all this screen, I guess. Um, but, you know, the, the original work was pioneered by Tobias Kippenberg's group in silicon microtoroids. Um, there's been a lot of other groups that have um, worked, for example, on uh, uh, the fluorides, the quartz, and NIST and OE waves and so forth. Uh, uh, for integrated platforms, uh, there's been development in high index glass. 
uh, silicon nitride, silicon, diamond, and also more recently, um, you know, it, um, there, there's been exciting materials that also exhibit Chi2 um, properties, including aluminum nitride, lithium niobate, and aluminum gallium arsenide. There's also been a lot of different approaches for, for tuning um, and generating the Kirkholms. So, you know, there's the traditional approach of um, uh, laser tuning, um, pump power tuning, um, you know, phase modulation using pulse pump. So, um, in our group, uh, what we've been doing is uh, resonance tuning using the thermal optic effect. So, what we do is use these um, uh, deposit these uh, platinum resistive uh, heaters directly on top of the waveguide. So, you can see that in this microscope image um, with the, the, the structure here um, that's kind of in white. Um, so, what we can do is, you know, thermally tune the cavity of re resonance uh, towards a fixed laser um, and to initiate the comb generation process. Um, and we see that, you know, in, even in silicon nitride, the thermal res response time is fairly fast on the order of about 20 microseconds. So, you know, we can readily tune into that soliton state. So, here's a typical experimental uh, generation dynamics for soliton mode locking in silicon nitride. Um, so, the left here shows the optical spectrum, and then the, the right is the corresponding RF spectrum. So, as you tune into resonance, uh, just like in the theory, you start uh, getting these primary sidebands or Turing rolls to form. And then, with further tuning, you get into this fully uh, native, uh, the spaced cone to form. But you can see uh, in the RF spectrum, you have quite a large RF amplitude noise. So, we, we, we call this like the chaotic like behavior. And then with further tuning, you can transition to into a phase lock state where the RF noise, you know, significantly drops. Um, and then you can access also this multi soliton state where you have multiple solitons propagating the cavity. And then finally, this single soliton state, which is natively spaced. So, more recently, we've been able to take this technology further and basically interface a high Q silicon nitride microresonator. With, a, with an RSOA uh, device so that we can have both the, the laser and the Kirkholm on the chip. So uh, this was work that was led by Brian Stern and Michal Lipson's group, where the, the RSOA chip um, that's kind of here is, is uh, pumped electrically. And then, um, you know, the, the, the coupling between the RSOA chip and the nitride chip uh, is such that you can get optical feedback from the high Q microresonator to go all the way back into the RSOA, which allows for lasing. Uh, that's shown here, and then uh, subsequent soliton formation. Um, so, you know, this is a fairly efficient process, and you can actually uh, drive the RSOA with a single AAA battery. And, you know, the, the compact uh, nature of this system, uh, we think that it has quite a lot of potential for, you know, realizing a chip scale WVM source for data comm. And, uh, you know, the, there's been, you know, a lot of work on this recently um, on this full integration of a Kirkholm. Also by Kerry Bahala's group at uh, Caltech, John Bauer's group at UCSB, and also Tobias Kippenberg's group at EPFL. So uh, there, there is there are some drawbacks of using solitons, however, um, and one of the main issues is the the low uh, pump to comb conversion efficiency that you get um, for you know dissipative curve solitons. Uh, so typically, conversion efficiency is limited to a few percent. Um, the plot on the bottom shows uh, um, the theoretical and experimental characterization of conversion efficiency as a function of the resonator free spectral range. Uh, so, if you take a look at the critical coupling conditions between the, the, the bus waveguide and the resonator, um, the efficiency scales as the square root of the free spectral range. And you can see even if you as you go up to you know, high FSRs of uh, 600 gigahertz, the efficiency is still less than 3%. So you can you can certainly improve this by operating the overcoupling regime, overcoupled regime, but the efficiency even there is still limited. So, you know, we've been looking into some alternative approaches for in, uh, improving this point. Um, yeah, so you, know, you can actually generate uh, Kirkholms also in the normal group velocity dispersion uh, regime as well. Um, this is an area that uh, a lot of different groups are getting into, and uh, recently it's been shown that you can get very high conversion efficiencies beyond 40% operating in this regime. Um, but typically, operating in the normal group velocity dispersion regime is not ideal for phase matching, um, uh, for mixing interactions. So you, you typically need either a, a mode interaction to locally shift the resonances or to use some sort of laser injection locking. So this is how it works. 
So in our case, we use mode coupling. And what happens is that the interaction that you get between the two interacting modes results in the splitting of the resonance like shown here. So if you take a look at the, you know, the local shift in resonance, um, you can see that the, the position of the resonance is shift uh, like you, you can see down here. And that actually, the, that shift actually allows for phase matching to generate modulation and stability sidebands, which help to facilitate cone formation. So, you know, there, there's a lot of different approaches that you can use to do um, mode interactions. You can use, you know, coupling between different uh, spatial modes in the, the resonator. You can use different polarization. Um, and what we did uh, in this case is use a, a coupled ring geometry where you have a, a main resonator and a bus resonator uh, and an auxiliary resonator. So um, here, here's a typical uh, microscope image of the, the coupled ring resonator that we use. So we have the bus waveguide like this. And then we have the, the main resonator where a uh, large amount of the power is. And then you have this auxiliary resonator in order to create this mode interaction. So uh, just like in the, the soliton case, we have these um, integrated resistive heaters. Um, so that, that actually can control the, rel uh, the, the position of the, the, the resonance uh, frequencies of the auxiliary and main resonators. And that actually is what allows for controlling the, the location of the mode crossing as well. So here's a plot of the, the normal GVD uh, comb generation dynamics. So what we do in this case is we start by tuning the auxiliary ring resonance uh, such that we have the mode crossing position very close to the pump. And then what we do is um, you know, reduce the heater power um, on the main uh, ring resonance in order to generate the, the comb. So you know, the plot here basically shows the generation dynamics as we reduce the heater power. So you can see, you basically see the, the primary sidebands generating kind of similar to the Kirk, uh, the Salton Kirkholms. Um, and then you also get into this high noise state and finally this uh, low noise phase locked uh, normal GVD comb. So you can see here on the bottom of the spectral evolution that you know there's actually a quite a large range of heater powers where you can actually sustain this normal GVD comb. And the, this, this actually uh, allows us to, you know, uh, reach this um, uh, turkey operation state where we can just, uh, you know, use a computer, pro uh, computer program to basically generate this comb generation re repeatedly. So here's a, a typical spectrum um, that we get uh, from the normal GVD comb. So we basically have 180 milliwatts of pump power um, in the bus waveguide to do this, and we get about a 41% pump to comb conversion efficiency. So you know you can see here there's quite a lot of lines here above one milliwatt in this case. So you know we we get a, a quite a large efficiency compared to the few percent that you can get in solitons, and we think that uh, this approach would be more ideal for being able to realize a. a, a uh, WDM source um, potentially for communication applications. So, you know, we've been continuing to look at other ways of being able to improve the comb line power. And in another approach that we've looked at is uh, using synchronization. So, you know, the synchronization phenomenon itself is quite ubiquitous in uh, nature. Uh, this was first reported by uh, Christian Huygens in 1665 basically have um, you know two pendulum uh, clocks that are suspended um, um, under a wooden beam. And it turns out that the, the coupling you get from the small vibrations in that wooden beam allow for the, the, the period of the two pendulum clocks to become mutually locked. So uh, there's a lot of different areas um, uh, where you can actually see synchronization. Uh, you can also see this in uh, nature in the flashing of fireflies. Uh, crickets chirping, um, uh, pacemakers in um, mammals' hearts. You know, you can see it in physics, in Joseph's injunctions, coupled lasers. Uh, there's actually a very nice paper um, by C. Strogatz at Cornell that reviews uh, synchronization of coupled oscillators and the Kuramoto model for synchronization. Um, so in, 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 this, uh, in this work, we'll be focusing on, you know, the synchronization of optical frequency combs. So, um, here's the illustration of the concept. So you can consider two nearly identical microresonators for, for generating Kirkholms um, using the same CW laser. But um, you know, whether it's due to fabrication tolerances or environmental fluctuations or even you know, temperature gradients, 
um, the, the, the comb spacing or the repetition rate is different between the primary comb and the secondary comb. So what you can do in this case is just um, introduce a small coupling signal, less than 1% of the power. Uh, you can couple it from the, the primary comb to the secondary comb, and you can actually synchronize the timing of the solitons, meaning that you can lock the repetition rate. So if you take a look at the, the mathematical model, um, so if you, uh, you can compare the evolution of the temporal position of the secondary uh, cavity soliton, and that ex expression looks quite like the universal synchronization model that was developed by Yoshiki Kuramoto. So, um, and here's our experimental results. So what we do is combine the, uh, the output um, from the primary and secondary combs and send it to an optical spectrum analyzer and an RS spectrum analyzer. So um, the first case is where the, the coupling is turned off. And here on the OSA, we basically just get, um, you know, incoherent addition of the two comb lines. Um, the, the combs have a slightly different spacing, um, which, you know, can not be resolved with an OSA, but the, that, that repetition rate difference shows up as beat notes in the RF domain that's shown here. So then when you turn the, the, the coupling signal on, uh, you start seeing modulations in the optical spectrum that comes from the interference between the two combs. You can also see that the beat note just disappears from the fact now from the fact that the comb lines are overlapped in frequency, meaning the repetition rates of the two combs are now synchronized. So <clears throat> we've also extended this study into the normal group velocity dispersion regime. Um, and we've been able to show synchronization of the two normal GVD combs that we showed earlier. And again, the, the amount of um, power that we, we send in is again about 1%. Um, so, you know, once the repetition rates are matched, what we can do is tune the relative path length of the two ar output arms. And that what, what that can allow for is coherent combining to be able to increase the power of the, the effective comb by more than a factor of two. Um, so we're currently working on um, on-chip coherent combining, um, where we we basically have a fully integrated version of this, where we have you know the, both both the primary and secondary comb along with this coupling link all on one chip. So as the demand for um, energy efficient um, high bandwidth communication goes up, we feel that uh, you know Kirk homes can be a, a particularly a viable solution for being able to realize massively parallel WDM transmission. So um, we believe that, you know, by using an uh, aggregated comb source, um, we can implement um, a scalable approach for future data centers, um, um, enabling multi-terabit scale chip-to-chip -chip links, connecting, you know, high bandwidth uh, memory stacks to graphic proce uh, graphics processing units. So here's an overview of the scalable architecture uh, to, to be able to increase the number of usable channels on an integrated transmitter chip. Uh, this was work that was led by Karen Bergman's group, um, also at Columbia University. <clears throat> so the link in this case um, uses a, 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 a Kirk comb, normal GVD comb as the WDM source, which is sent to a, the transmitter chip. So the comb interleaving and deinterleaving in this case is done using a uh, resonator assisted Moxander interferometer. And this essentially allows for reducing the number of cascaded modulators that are on a single bus. So the receiving link is also similar and basically have the, the D interleaver here and um, an, uh, an array of cascaded uh, photodiodes um, on each of these buses. So today I'll be focusing on the transmitter chip. So um, this, this fabricated chip here is a, a 32 channel transmitter chip on a footprint of you know 1.1 millimeters by 4.15 millimeters. So this was fabricated in a commercial 300 millimeter foundry and with electrical and optical pack, pack, packaging done by Optelligent. So the bottom here shows the, the setup. Again, the, this, this section here is the, the normal GVD comb generator. So then that's again, sent into the, the, the transmitter chip. So this um, 96 channel um, source measurement unit essentially is providing the, the, the bias. And uh, what we do is send in a, a PRBS uh, 31 signal uh, uh, into the modulators for BER testing. And then the modulated comb output is uh, collected with fiber and sent into the receiver, which consists of you know, a photodiode and a trans impedance amplifier. So that electrical signal um, that's generated here 
is sent into a real-time real oscilloscope for um, eye diagram characterization and also um, a BERT for doing the bitter array testing. So here's the uh, uh, the results of the 32 channel transmitter. Um, so <clears throat> you can see from the, the eye diagrams here that for both 10 gigabit per second and 16 gigabit per second, um, all the modulators display an open eye and we are able to see 100% yield for the, the photonic devices on that chip. So um, the BR measurement to the right here um, show that at both 10 gigabit and 16 gigabit, all the cone lines uh, show a BER better than 10 to the uh, minus 8, with most being better than 10 to the minus 9. So, you know, again, with further link optimization, you know, we really think that Kirk Holmes offer promise as a next generation WDM source, you know, to replace the currently used laser arrays with a single module. Okay, so I uh, just want to switch gears here now and talk about the degenerate OPO. Um, so I, I already talked about Kirk Holmes earlier, which, you know, again, are initiated by parametric oscillation, right? So you basically start with a single pump and generate the signal in either pair sidebands. So uh, now I'll be talking about the degenerate optical parametric oscillator, where you can generate a, a frequency degenerate uh, signal in either pair. So uh, degenerate OPOs have been demonstrated both in CHI-2 and CHI-3 media. So in CHI-2, it works through the process of difference frequency generation, where you start with a single pump and then generate a you know, frequency degenerate signal in either pair like this. Um, you can also do this in a CHI-3 medium where you have uh, you know, two, two pumps that are frequency non-degenerate and then generate this um, frequency degenerate signal in either pair right in between. So um, it turns out that when the degenerate OPO reaches this oscillation threshold, though, um, it undergoes this binary phase transition. So um, what happens in this case is the signal um, phase locks to the pump with one of two possible states that are offset by pi. Um, so you know th this this largely comes from the phase matching conditions that are shown here. So, you know, in the CHI-2 case and CHI-3 case, you can see that there's this factor of two in front of the signal phase. So, you know, you can see that you, know, you can have a, a zero or pi offset, um, and you can still get the same exact phase matching conditions, and that allows for the, the, the rise in this bi-phase state. So, um, you know, you can consider these two different states, so zero phase to be spin up or spin down. So you can think of this as effectively an artificial photonic spin. Um, one of the nice um, aspects of degenerate OPOs is that since the OPO is initiated from quantum noise, the, the photon spins that are, uh, that are produced are intrinsically unbiased. And that allows us to do you know, a lot of cool things with it. Um, so just a quick, quick theory um, on CHI-3 chi degenerate OPOs. So in order to uh, get, the, get the degenerate OPO to work, you, you basically have to have maximum gain at that frequency degeneracy point. So you can also model this using the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, where you have the, you know, this is just beta 2, the group velocity dispersion, and you have gamma, which is the nonlinear parameter. So uh, you want to take a look at the parametric gain uh, for, for two pumps. So uh, what we do is define two parameters here. Uh, the dispersion length is given by this expression where delta corresponds to the, the offset between the, the pump and then the degener uh, degeneracy point. Um, beta 2 is the group velocity dispersion, and then you have gamma, again, is the nonlinear parameter for defining the nonlinear length. Uh, P, in this case, is the pump power. So here's the plot of the gain for two pumps um, for both normal and anomalous group velocity dispersion. So you can see in the top uh, left corner here, when the dispersion length is larger than the nonlinear length, you can actually get the condition where you have the maximum gain at the degeneracy point. And this is the, the operating condition that we want to use for achieving the degenerate OPO. So uh, first, we wanted to experimentally verify that we have a bi-phase state. So we modulate one of the pumps using an acousto-optic modulator uh, such that each pulse uh, generates uh, its own degenerate OPO state. So the repetition rate in this case, also the and also the pulse duration is chosen 
such that the OPO, um, after it's generated, can decay all the way back down to noise before the next pulse comes. And that, that time scale is largely dependent on the cavity decay rate. So the bottom plot here uh, shows the typical uh, OPO spectrum, where again, the two high peaks correspond to the pump. You, know, you can have this OPO spectrum right in between. So in order to characterize the, the biphase state, what we do is send the output to an asymmetric mox ender interferometer. Uh, and what we, can, we use that to measure the relative phase between the adjacent pulses that are generated. <clears throat> so here's, here's our, our temporal measurement. So what we do in this case is about 217,000 phase measurements uh, to show two distinct states. So the top one is basically the a tap signal from one of the arms of the mock sender, and the bottom one is the, the measured interference. So you can see, you know, we basically have these two states, um, the high peaks corresponding to constructive interference and the low peak corresponding to destructive interference. So we can indeed verify experimentally that we, we are indeed generating a biphase state. So, you know, actually what we can do is assign, you know, ones and zeros to the constructive and destructive interference. And uh, we've been able to also realize a, a random number generator, in this case at a two megahertz uh, generation rate. <clears throat> so random numbers are, you know, a critical component for you know, a variety of applications recently, including uh, cryptography, Monte Carlo simulations, gaming, and so forth. Um, uh, typically, the requirement for randomness is both uh, uni uniformity, meaning that you have as many ones and zeros, and also independence, meaning that each bit is uncorrelated from the previous bit. So, you know, in order to realize a random number generator, you require a high quality entropy source. And there's been a lot of um, uh, optical approaches for generating this, including um, amplified spontaneous emission, um, phase noise measurements, uh, photon arrival time, spontaneous Raman scattering, and also photon num number path um, entanglement. So the approach that we've been using is uh, using the degenerate OPO. And again, one of the nice aspects about uh, degenerate OPO is, you know, we're actually measuring a classical signal since we're operating above threshold. And also since um, the, the process is initiated from noise, it's uh, intrinsically unbiased. So in our previous approach that I showed a couple of slides ago, we basically used an off-chip acoustic-optic acoustic modulator to amplitude one, uh, modulate one of the pulses to generate these bits. So we wanted to do further integration, integration. So what we wanted to do is bring the modulation element on chip. So to do this in silicon nitride, uh, what we do is drive the integrated heaters with uh, uh, thermal, uh, thermal tuning in order to you know, get the, uh, control the resonance position for generating the, the turning on and off the OPO. So if you take a look at the single device, um, you know, if you, so if you modulate with, you know, using uh, the thermal optic effect, what happens is all the resonances shift together. So the, the cavity decay rate in this case is inversely proportional to the Q factor. So in order to speed up that, that process, what we consider is a coupled ring geometry. So in this case, what we do is, um, you know, you use the mode interaction so that we can implement the avoided mode crossing at that degenerate OPO mode. So what we can do is tune uh, in and out that uh, mode crossing position to turn on and off the OPO. And, you know, in, in this case, what happens is not only do you introduce loss, but you can also introduce a local uh, localized change in the dispersion as well and allow for dynamic control of the photon lifetime. So here's the device. Um, so, you know, we, we've designed this coupled microresonator to have a normal group velocity dispersion. The free spectral range also in this case is 200 gigahertz. Um, and we, we for, for this device, um, when the auxiliary ring is uh, positioned far away in terms of the resonance, we measure a load of Q of about 720,000, which corresponds to a photon lifetime of 480 picoseconds. Um, and again, um, the, these, these pads here and the, are, are the integrated heaters um, that we can use to control the position of the, the main and auxiliary ring resonances and effectively control the position where the mode interaction occurs. So here's the generated OPO from the, the coupled ring device. So the high peaks again correspond to the pump and we have the OPO generated in between at 1549.4 nanometers in this case. So, you know, to now to turn on and off the, the OPO, 
we drive the heater on the auxiliary ring uh, using these RF pulses. Um, you know, again, we choose the, the pulse duration and also the repetition rate in this case so that we can suppress each of the OPOs down to the noise level. Um, here's the uh, temporal measurement. So again, just like before, you can assign uh, ones to the constructive interference and zeros to the low peaks for destructive interference. And for this case, we're able to achieve a generation rate of about 505 kilobits per second. And so in order to verify that we have um, good random numbers, um, we took a 101,000 um, bit sequence and sent it to the NIST uh, statistical test suite uh, to test for both uniformity and independence. So here are the test results. Um, so p-value in this case uh, measures the uniformity and proportion measures the independence. And we see that um, you know, our, our test sample satisfies both uniformity and independence for all the statistical tests, indicating that we can you know, generate good random numbers. So we've also performed um, uh, modeling of the photon lifetime in both the single and coupled ring uh, system. So the plot, um, the black curve here shows the single ring and the red one is the coupled ring for similar to our experimental conditions. So um, 1.5 million Q in this case uh, corresponds to the intrinsic, um, sorry, uh, so the, 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 the one, Q of 1.5 million corresponds to experimental conditions. And in this case, we see a 3.7 times decrease in the photon lifetime indicating that, you know, in principle, we should be able to reach generation rates of about 680 kilohertz. So um, you can further in, uh, uh, achieve an even larger reduction um, by using a strong, stronger drop port coupling, which is this blue curve. And uh, for this case, we're able to see uh, an even larger factor of a uh, factor of 16 reduction, which means that we can uh, reach generation rates of three megahertz. And you can see the scaling is even better when you go to higher Qs, meaning that we can we can also use lower pump powers as well. So, you know, while silicon nitride is limited ultimately by the thermal tuning speed, you can imagine you can generate uh, random numbers at an even faster rate by using faster tuning mechanisms like uh, carrier injection in silicon or the electro electro optic effect in Chi two materials as well. So, you know, we, we think that this could be a, um, an interesting approach for being able to uh, generate a chip scale uh, entropy source. So the last part of the talk, uh, I wanna talk about the coherent Ising machine. So um, the Ising model originally was developed um, for modeling phase transitions and ferromagnetism. Um, this can be characterized by a Hamiltonian where you basically have these sigma terms correspond to the spins, and then JIJ in this case corresponds to the coupling between the, the different spins. So uh, it turns out um, finding the ground state of such a system corresponds to uh, an MP hard type computation problem. And you can use polynomial time mapping and actually map to other MP complete problems as well. So, the, the Ising machine falls under a category of computing accelerators, and there's been a quite a, a bit of interest in developing uh, these kind of accelerators for solving uh, combinatorial optimization problems where the problem solves uh, problem scales both uh, exponentially both in time and energy. So there's been a lot of different applications here, including uh, artificial intelligence, bioinformatics, cryptography, and so forth. Um, so th this this is this uh, concept of being able to realize a photonic uh, Ising machine has been around for a long time. Um, you know the studies have gone back to back in two thousand eleven. Um, so in order to realize a physical uh, system, you require two things. One is the binary degree of freedom, and you also want reconfigurable coupling. So you know there there's been a lot of work done on coupled laser systems. Uh, there's been people that have worked on, uh, you know, a fiber-based um, uh, degenerate uh, optical parametric oscillator, and also um, more recently, um, optoelectronics uh, oscillators with cell feedback, spatial light modulators, and dispersive optical biostabilities as well. So in our approach, um, we use a, um, a Chi three optical parametric oscillator and a silicon nitride uh, silicon nitride microresonator. Um, so here's kind of a concept illustration. So you basically generate all the different OPOs in the rings, and then the coupling is done through spatial multiplexing using these uh, array of coupling waveguides.
So, you know, we, we've considered a, a, a two OPO system. So in this case, we have an uncoupled system where, um, where uh, we, we start with a, a pump that's sent into the device. Um, the, the, the power is split using a multimode interference splitter and sent into OPO1 and OPO2. Um, so each of the microresonators, again, can be thermally controlled using the integrated heaters. And uh, that actually allows for simultaneous oscillation of OPO1 and OPO2, like shown in the bottom. So here's the setup for characterizing the system. So this is very similar to the original um, uh, OPO demonstration that we showed earlier. So um, we, we modulate one of the, the um, one of the pumps using an acoustic optic modulator uh, so that we can characterize the successive OPO runs. So for each pump pulse, what we can do is measure the individual OPO output shown here and here. And also the interference between the two OPOs uh, um, using this interferometer, uh, free space interferometer, uh, shown here in the middle. So uh, here is the the temporal measurements. So the the top one shows the interference, and then the individual OPOs. And you can see, you know, when when you have no coupling uh, between the two, um, you see independent oscillations that are generating these uncorrelated biphase states. So then now. Uh, we develop a chip that has a, a coupling waveguide in between. Um, so what we can do is, you know, also using integrated heaters, uh, con uh, by thermally tuning the, the waveguide, you can uh, configure the system to have in-phase or out-of-phase coupling. So um, the, the setup for measuring the interference is the same as before. So I just want to point out here that the interference in this case now corresponds to a solution of, uh, you know, a two OPO Ising system. So uh, here's our interference measurement. Um, on the right here, I show the coupling phase diagram. So for the top plot, we configure in this pink region. Um, uh, and what we're able to do is get in-phase operation between the two OPOs, which shows up as constructive interference. The middle one, um, we operate in the blue region here. And uh, we're actually able to operate um, out of phase operation between the two OPOs, um, and that shows up as destructive interference here, right? And then the bottom shows op uh, operation kind of in this transition region, where you can see the oscillations actually uh, kind of frustrated and uncorrelated. Um, so we zoom into the, the the pulses for in phase operation in this case. Um, and each of the pulses in this case, again, shows the interference between the two OPOs that are generated, um, which is, you know, again, the solution of the two OPOs uh, Ising system. So in this system, we're able to actually get a pretty fast convergence time of about 120 nanoseconds. And the computing rate, which is the repetition rate of the pulses, which is 400 kilohertz. So we've also performed some modeling, modeling of the degenerate OPO. Um, we can do this using a coupled Lugiato Lefebvre equation. Uh, so this is kind of similar to the original Kirkholm modeling, except now we have a, a, a dual pump here. And this, this, this kappa term E1 corresponds to the coupling between the, the two OPOs. So here's the simulation, uh, just very similar to the experiment. We're able to get in phase operation for a, a coupling phase of minus 70 to 70 degrees here. Um, you see out of phase behavior for you know coupling phases between 110 and 250 degrees. <laughs> and then uh, again, similar to the experiment, we get this um, you know uncorrelated regime when we operate in the transition region. So we've uh, um, actually extended our modeling to a system of 100 OPO. And in this case, we can simulate a, a max cut problem of under, undirected graphs with 100 nodes. Uh, this, this is a configuration that's known as the Mobius ladder graph. And it's been used as a, a benchmark problem for evaluating the performance of you know, various uh, physical photonic ising machines. The plot in this case shows the, the signal power, the signal phase, and also the ising Hamiltonian for uh, 100 coupled OPOs. And you can see from the evolution of the, the Ising Hamiltonian that the system indeed is uh, attempting to minimize the overall energy, meaning that the you know the, the Ising machine is working. Um, so the our simulation uh, shows an annealed time of about 200 nanoseconds, um, with a success probability of 0 0.35. <clears throat> so this corresponds to a time to solution of about 2.1 microseconds, indeed uh, indicating that our system uh, com uh, compares 
fairly uh, favorably to state-of-the-art electronic and digital systems. So, you know, um, so we've been able to develop a building, building block uh, towards the chip scale Ising machine. Um, you know, the bottom in this case shows a fabricated uh, 4 OPO chip where we basically have a series of mock sender um, uh, interferometers to do the reconfigurable coupling. And we also think that this could be a, a pretty intriguing platform for being able to study the, the coupled OPO dynamics in the presence of quantum effects. So uh, last, I just wanted to thank all the different um, you know, group members from both uh, Alex uh, Guided Group and Michal Lipson's group that have contributed to this work and also all, all of our funding, um, uh, funding agents. And uh, thanks very much everybody for your attention. Aren't you proud about us? Thank you uh, for a very nice talk. Part of the work that's happened among the two groups. Uh, so there's some, uh, yeah. so there's some your voice is a bit nice. You can check. Yeah. So can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Yoshi, for a nice talk. Um, a lot of work that you've covered. Um, I think that's happening in stages over several years. Uh, so uh, the stage is open for questions. I have several in the Q&A box. Uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A box. Maybe. I take them in the order they were typed. Um, the first question is from Nagarajan. Uh, it says, uh, in the normal GVD case, uh, beta 4 plays a major role in the four-way mixing process. So what is the value of beta 4 in the proposed home generation? Um. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I actually can't remember the exact value of beta four for our case, but, um, you know, so for, I, I guess what, what can happen is if you, if you operate in the regime where beta two is very small, right, then you can get, you know, phase matching, um, to, to allow for these like really far away side bands to generate through the beta four phase matching. But in, in this case, um, we're operating in the regime where, you know, for example, beta two is larger than, um, uh 100 uh picoseconds squared per kilometer so like it's it's a quite a large value so in that case um you know the the dominant contribution to the the dispersion is um beta two um so in 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 the regime that we're operating in beta four doesn't really play much of a role okay. i hope that answers your question uh so we have our in-house PhD student who is working on homes. She's gone to town with the questions. Uh, she has about three questions of her own. Uh, I'll try to pick a few, but uh, I think this uh, is a good platform to perhaps uh, engage on this discussion even offline. So Pranitha, you should probably try and uh, catch up. Um, offline if we don't have time to cover all these. So I'll take up some of these. Um, so we have uh, many materials. So you showed a lot of materials that are being used for uh, home generation, right? So silicon nitride, uh, silicon carbide, um, Do you see a clear winner right now? Uh, what, what are the material properties that you think is uh, um, that occur from generators. Yeah, so I, I you know, I, I think in terms of integration, um, you know, a lot of the platforms on the bottom, for example, silicon nitride, aluminum nitride, um, lithium nitride, like e, e, there, there's also been, you know, some other new platforms as well um, that it's, it's eluding me right now in my, in my mind, but like, you know, silicon nitride has become very well developed, um, but, uh, you know, like, I, I guess in terms of, 
I, I guess it really depends on the application. Um, you know, if, if you're operating in the mid infrared, for example, you 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 want to go to silicon just because of the transparency window, um, or even you know maybe silicon geranium or so forth, right? Um, if if you want to consider doing you know like simultaneous f to two f interferometry, for example, if you have a very broad comb, you know uh, aluminum nitride and lithium niobate might be a nice platform, um, just because of the inherent chi two, um, you know. Uh, uh, we, since we work on silicon nitride, I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for silicon nitride in terms of, you know, the in, in terms of the the losses that have been achieved, and you know, the, a lot of the kind of knowledge in terms of being able to couple in in and out of the device and so forth. Um, so, so I I, I I guess you know, in terms of platforms, I I feel like those are kind of the the ideal ones to go with. Um, but you know, there there's there's still um further development happening even on the other uh, you know some of the newer platforms as well so i i i'm not so sure it, it's you know that I, I i guess ultimately um what will win out is whatever that can be actually you know developed and processed in a foundry for example right so right. i think that's still to be seen right because i think calcium fluoride i think still holds the record for cube right yeah Helium or something uh, but it's also on chip. I think it's probably the nitride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the next question, um, actually, there are a few that she's targeting on 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 just analyzing these phones. So let's start with the first one, which is the LLE equation. Look here in the part of the equation. Um, what kind of tools do you use to do those numerical simulations? Um, okay, so the, the the question for numerical modeling. Yeah, so so I I mean I, I personally use MATLAB, um, but you know like you can you know that our, our our group also uses Python. Um, I, I mean they're they're since since you're largely for most of these uh, simulations, since you're using um, um, the the split step Fourier method, the, it's not as computationally intensive. You know, like I, I, of course, when you start incorporating, um, you know, chi two nonlinearities, for example, then um, it, it becomes a little bit more intensive, and you can't, you no longer can use the split step method to do do it directly. So, you know, but um, largely you could just do it on. You know, a typical you know laptop or something, so it's not right. too intense. It sort of, I mean, separates from my understanding the envelope of mm -hmm. the optical field from the actual electric field that's fluctuating with the terahertz, right? So yeah, you don't have the regular issue of trying to discretize that the optical frequency times the other. Yeah, and, and you know, this, another key for this is, you know, just, just because um, you can also um, take advantage of um, what's known as the mean field approach. So, you know, you, you can kind of assume that the, the round trip phase shift is pretty small. So you can, um, you know, you, you can also incorporate the coupling and the uh, coupling terms into the, the, the propagation equation. So it's, it, it, that also helps to reduce the um, uh, the number of steps that you need to, to to converse to a solution as well. The next one is an interesting one. She's asking what's the origin of the carrier envelope offset frequency. Oh, um, so that that's basically just the um, you know I, I guess it's it's it, it also arises from the difference in the phase and groove velocity. Um, so it, it's just kind of the phase flip that you get. Um, and the pulses as you, you know, propagate, um, you know, through the cavity. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read the question. I'm thinking. Um, so she wants to understand this concept of modulation instability. Uh, what's the reason of physical phenomena that is responsible for modulation in this Oh, so, you know, so it, it's a, 
I, I guess you can think of it as a spontaneous uh, forward mixing effect. So, you know, it, it's basically, um, you know, essentially modulation instability occurs because, you know, you're, you're in the right uh, dispersion regime such that you, you annihilate two pump photons and create this signal neither. So, um, so it, it's basically, you know, the, 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 the signal in either pair being generated from noise. Um, next question. So she asks if there's any uh, uh, interest, research interest in the multiple soliton states. Um, perhaps filtering out these independent solitons and studying them. Is there any use uh, in that direction? Studying the uh, multiple soliton region. Yeah. Um. So so there there's been a lot of work. Um. You know, uh, one one that immediately comes to mind is the the NIST group. Um. A actually uses you know mode interactions to actually specifically control. Um. You know how many like control how many solitons can be can be generated. So um, depending on the the position of the the mode interaction or the the strength, you can you know th this is also work that was done by um, Andrew Weiner's group as well, um, where you can control you know how many solitons are propagating inside. Um, in terms of application, you know, like I, I guess one of the nice things is if you take a look in the spectral domain, you know, a multi soliton state inherently has more power. Um, so for some of the applications, for example, for F to two F, um, you know, where where you require you know more more power for doing the the interferometry, um, or you know, for even for uh, I guess even for data com applications, there might be some. In, um, Something there in terms of using a multi soliton state, um, just because you have more enhanced power in the coal mines. But um, I'm not sure if there's been specific applications, at least that I'm aware of, that have been demonstrated with it. Because the art of noise is quite low even in those states, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's pertaining to the specific slide, she says, could you explain the frequency versus detuning plot uh, in the generation dynamics slide? Huh. Um, I guess. Anita, can you uh, mute uh, if you can remember which slide it was? Is it for this one or is it for the normal GVD call? Maybe she's uh, struggling to get on the mic. Um, we can probably go to our next question. Uh, so, is there uh, any work going on right now in terms of manipulating the third and fourth order dispersion? to enhance the stone generation process? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess I didn't mention it today. Um, so maybe what I could do, I'm not sure if I slide on this. Yeah, so so what, what happens when you, um, when you consider, you know, higher order dispersion is what you can do is excite um, what are known as dispersive waves. So the, these are, you know, they're, they're, they're also known as, um, you know, Trenikoff radiation. So the, it's right. basically a phase match process to generate, you know, uh, a, a narrow uh, resonance peak, if you will, at a, you know, far away position. So, you know, particularly for doing, you know, very broad combs like Aquaspan and Kerr combs, for example, the presence of these dispersive waves are really important um, just because, you know, it, it actually allows you to spectrally, um, you know, broaden the, the wings typically where you want to do um, uh, stabilization, uh, for example. So, 
Um, and that that's really dependent on beta three, beta four, um, like the higher order dispersion terms. So being able to you know precisely engineer the waveguide dispersion such that you have, um, you know the dispersive waves occurring at a specific location is pretty critical. And you know since since there's there's on the on the wafer scale there's a lot of variation in the um, film film thickness that you can fabricate right. Um, so you require a lot of, um, you know, mapping of that particular wafer, for example, or or being able to have a lot of different devices so that you know you can actually get the right dispersion profile on the given chip. So, um, you know, so yeah, so for certain certainly being able to you know uh, uh, repeatedly being able to generate uh, you know deliver devices that can do that, I think is is a current challenge. Um, so the next question is from Shashan. How does the application complexity scale for the on-chip uh, DOPO, digital DOPO, based coherent icing machine, the increasing number of spins? Yeah. Uh, so. So currently, you know, we, we, we've scaled up and we're working on like a 4 OPO chip like that I showed at the very end. But, um, you know, th this is similar to w w what I mentioned about the, um, you know, finding the right device to do optus, uh, optus span in Kirkholms as well, I guess. Um, you know, like in, in terms of e even within a, you know, a, a centimeter or chip, the you know, the, even if you fabricate identical resonators, there's going to be the variations in the FSR that come from the fact that, you know, there, there's height variations or, you know, within the fabrication tolerance, right? So, no, it certainly is a, is a challenge um, um, being able to go to a large number. And, you know, perhaps there's um, maybe other approaches that you can, you can think about to be able to, you know, uh, kind of, to, to have uh, more consistent, uh, I, I guess, more consistent FSR devices, or maybe other ways of being able to generate um, the the OPOs itself. Um, so that's that's still something that we're thinking about. Just because, you know, I, I mean, for for sure, being able to scale to you know, hundred OPOs, it sounds quite challenging in this particular platform. So there must be a more elegant approach to be able to do this, and we're we're currently still thinking about. That. Um, I had a question regarding this application today. Uh, sorry. Um, so these are about 700 nanometer thick money type. Right? So, yeah. Uh, can you grow them in house, Columbia? Uh, so this is this is work done um, by by Michal Lipson Group. So they 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 do the 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 growth at um, yeah nanofiber. Uh, a nanofabrication facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay, so all the, all their tricks to not getting any cracks on the programs. Um, yeah, the, the, I, I guess the technical details are probably a good idea to refer to them. <laughs> Did you hear about the work from Letty recently on trying to grow nitride in stacks, the twist and throw method? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I think you know one one of the one of the things with nitride is there's a lot of stress, so it's 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 quite different from some of the other materials where you can you know, um, you can just like, um, you, you can just do it in one shot. So, um, there there are certain challenges in terms of being able to you know get to the right thickness just because of, of the stress. So, you know the the details of the tricks that that are used. <laughs> Kind of beyond my pay grade, but um, yeah. So uh, I see. Uh, Arna turned on this video. Do you have any questions? Yeah, okay, I have a question regarding the stability of the ring resonance. So when you, when you operate high power, did you face anything, any problem with the drifting of the resonance, or how, uh, how will you stabilize it, like at high power particularly? Actually, so that, that's that's a, re a really good question. Um, so. It, it it's actually more unstable at uh, low power, um, 
just be, so the you know the environmental fluctuations can potentially make the the resonances drift um you know on the order of tens of megahertz maybe even 100 megahertz um but as you operate at high power especially when you're operating in the um on the the blue side of the resonance i guess what, what you get is uh what's known as um, soft thermal lock so basically the, the 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 laser power inside the cavity essentially makes the the, the resonance kind of stay at that the right position because if the resonance shifts a certain direction then the you know the pump power enhances the shift it back or like you know if it goes the other way then you know the um it essentially the, the 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 pump cavity detuning ends up getting fixed in that way um and yeah so it, it, it actually is fairly stable particularly at higher pump power um at least in silicon nitrate so so there are you know in other platforms there are other other issues you know like there's uh for silicon there's 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 carriers um you know so you can it'll also kind of restrict the um and so that that actually induces actual losses as well um or in lithium niobate for example there's photorefractive effects so you know so those, those add, add on different stability so you know so there different materials have different um the origins of fluctuations so it's not universal but you know at least in silicon nitride um the large largely the effects are thermal so um you know, I, I guess I should clarify it also depends on what you're doing. Um, you know, just because for some some applications that even that level of thermal fluctuations become quite an issue. So Uh, I'm not sure if I lost people here. Oh, uh, yeah, I think there is a power cut here. I think all okay. things got suddenly. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. Oh, no problem. Uh, I think, uh, Sudarshanan, are you there? Uh, looks like entire campus uh, gone, actually. Oh, no. So, <laughs> so, so that's the problem, actually. Yeah. Anyway, I think it is almost over. Uh, I thought of asking a couple of questions. Maybe I can ask now. Maybe you want to learn. Sure. So uh, you see, I think it's a, it's a very good piece of work. I, I think a lot of work uh, I was thoroughly enjoying. Almost everything done uh, for silicon nitride, yeah, uh, related things. So uh, my question is, uh, where is the uh, 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 challenge? Uh, Difficult part uh, in silicon nitrite yet to be solved. Um, you know, I I guess it, I I think the key thing, and I I guess you know, like I I just heard recently that you know people have been starting to be able to do, um, higher, you know, higher quality um like LP CVD nitrite in foundries as well. So I think that's, um, you know, so that that's that's a big big thing to be solved just because you know like if um in terms of being able to mass produce these devices if it can only be done in like a 
uh, you know, university kind of level research, then you know, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of like, you know, like on chip devices that are supposed to be more like mass fabrication, right? Um, so that's that's one thing, and you know, so that but there's also still I I, I guess the each of them are more optimization, right? So to be able to improve the losses of the not not just propagation but for coupling losses and to be able to uh like if you're going to do heterogeneous integration between lasers and other ones right like because um it, it's not like you can use for example silicon nitride just to, to do everything because you know the modulators for example are largely on silicon or the lasers are if it's heter heterogeneously integrated it's it's typically with silicon as well i mean there's some nitride but So I, I think being able to, um, you know, so if, if you're going to do like some, some sort of hybrid integration, I guess that's, that's probably the, the, the current challenge. Like if you're going inter to interface with even lithium niobate or interface with, um, you know, a, a pump source, um, adding modulators onto the, the system. So I, I think that's the next step to be able to, um, yeah, to, to be able to have a, a full, um you know photonic integrated circuit i guess that has all these different elements right and where where you can incorporate silicon nitride into that yeah so that's a great i think yeah <clears throat> that's a good point i think uh, hybrid integration i uh, think that would be another option to include all this yeah. thing so I, I have one more uh point because you know for this comb generation all those type of thing you are you have to uh, really pump hard uh, you have to go to the chi 3 process uh, uh, threshold, all those type of things. But you know, another, all other nonlinear uh, stuffs like uh, uh, phonon assisted stuffs like uh, Brillan scattering, all those type of things. Are you, do you need to uh, take uh, under consideration for modeling all those type of things for getting, really to get a compact model to, for this type of structure? Or you think that those are negligibly small, you can ignore? Um, so in silicon nitride, um, you know, people have observed Brion, but the effects are very, pretty small. Um, so in, in terms of modeling, we haven't had to incorporate it. Uh, similar with Raman, um, you know, we, we've been actually trying to investigate whether Raman, you know, is a significant um, effect in nit uh, nitride as well. And um, to this point, we haven't really seen it. Um, like there, there, there's some work that talks about like self frequency shifting, but recently, you know, we, we've actually seen that, uh, self frequency shifting doesn't seem to occur in certain geometries. Um, and, you know, we, we, we've also done some, some quantum measurements and, you know, so one of the things that, uh, nitride soft suffers from is fluorescence, um, at low wavelengths, right? Like, so if you go down to 800 nanometers, you get flu uh, fluorescence, um, but at telecom, you know, you don't see those effects either. Um, and I think that has to do with the, the, the night, like the nitride wafers themselves. So, um, yeah, so at least in terms of silicon nitride modeling, um, you don't have to take those into account. At least that's what it seems. Um, but certainly other plat like, you know, silicon, uh, for example, uh, Raman is very strong. It's a narrow band effect, but it's very strong. Same thing with lithium niobate. Um, so you see a lot of these uh, Raman peaks that occur. Um, so for for to to be able to understand the full dynamics, then you definitely have to incorporate Raman. Um, you know, I, I, actually, in that sense, um, I, I I guess you do see so. I, I guess it hasn't affected our modeling, but, you know, you certainly do see, even in nitride, you still see, you know, chi 2 effects, um, just because you get the, um, you know, let, let, let's say some sort of imperfection or, um, you know, like the, the asymmetry that you get in bends, right? Or, um, so you still get chi 2 effects, so you, you can see a glow of, you know, red, for example, generating in the waveguide. So, you know, like I, I guess the effects are not like they're 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 not insignificant, but not enough to uh, disturb the cone generation process for most things. So we haven't had to incorporate it. But you know, like certainly when you're modeling, um, 
in, you know, like the, the F to 2F process, for example, if, if you're doing it, for example, in lithium ionic, then you want to incorporate chi tube effects as well. So, just a related question, I think. Uh, so, people already demonstrated uh, SBS uh, laser. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, especially for gyroscopic measurement, yeah. So yeah. there also there also you need to pump significantly. So I'm wondering uh, when people talk about SBS, they don't uh, they completely ignore uh, all this type of comb generation possibility of all this comb generation because comb generation can happen also at the power level, right? Mm. So that they completely ignore. Is that the thing? Is that because uh, that that is uh, that that is happening or not happening when you are just uh, encouraging SBS type of uh, uh, things, then all this comb generation is uh, suppressed completely. Or uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, because we are starting. We would like to start work on that direction. We would like to uh, know a little bit more about those type of aspects. Yeah. 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 Objects. I, that. Yeah. I guess I haven't been following. You know. To, to that extent, so I haven't I haven't really thought about it too much. Um, but you know, a, a, a lot of those particular lasers rely on more of the um. Yeah, that that's a good question. Um, yeah, I I haven't taken a look at what the dispersion profile is for. Uh, because I saw in Nature paper uh, they 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 target for this uh, balloon scattering laser and uh, they wanted to show some kind of gy gyroscopic rotation sensing purpose all those type of thing they are but uh, in that case also you are ne needing a lot of power but uh, they don't uh, they are completely silent about anything because it is a ring anyway mm. so obviously this type of comb generation may happen that solitone also may be generating you yeah no yeah I, you know, like if you consider fibers, though, for example, right? Like if you make a Brion, um, Brion laser in a in a fiber geometry, like since since the in 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 that regime, you know, SBS is one of the the you know lowest threshold nonlinear interactions that occur. Um, it, it it could be that in that regime, it's just that you know Brion oscillation is the dominant nonlinearity before all the other processes occur. Um, you know, I, I guess I can't necessarily answer answer that question just because you know I haven't quite studied the different dynamics that occur in in that particular platform. But you know, at least in the the fiber based systems, right? Like, um, you know, before all the other nonlinearities occur, like for example, if you just take a look at data transmission, um, you you want to make sure that you're you're below the Brillouin threshold before anything. So uh, you want to worry about that nonlinearity first. So uh you know like so it, it it could be that you just don't have to worry about the other processes just because you know brewon happens first um but yeah i'm not entirely sure yeah yeah uh so there's another because it was just brief power cut i i just yeah uh, so, no thank you i'm sorry about that uh, so you just dropped because there was a power cut yeah, I, I I tried to ensure that because since bonding there are a couple of power cuts happening, I tried to ensure they said that it will not happen anymore. But <laughs> it happened actually. So I'm sorry for that. I think uh, there is an interruption. Anyway, I think uh, yeah, Sudarshan, we are continuing some question. You can uh, is that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't see any more on my Q and A. Perhaps because I left the meeting and came back. Um, yeah. Do you see any question, new questions after Shashank's? Uh, uh, there are a couple of comments. Let me see. I think something. Okay, the Pranita, I think, bombarding a lot of questions. <laughs> That's good. I think she should just engage yeah. with uh, the speaker perhaps offline or maybe someone in the group as well. So I think, uh, you see, uh, we have a uh, student, Pranita, uh, she is heavily uh, studying all of your paper. I think she, she has a lot of questions. She may, uh, uh, I will ask her to communicate offline and uh, please help her. So, because you have been working for a long time, I think you can clear it of things. So, I have last question, one last question, so that with your permission, I want to ask. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you, you, whenever you plan for an experiment, you design the device, right? A ring resonator, all those type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, is there 
anything what specific other than your web guy dimension uh, related uh, discussion etc what about coupling uh, uh, things you, you consider don't you think about that uh, tuning uh, bit of coupling could help or increasing the efficiency or you get one more freedom uh, for optimizing your uh, device performance Oh, um, so so by by coupling, do you mean the the coupling between the the, you know, the bus wave and the ring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, for for sure. Like so, so you know, typically operating in the the overcoupled regime for normal GVD combs allows for a much higher efficiency combs, and that that's the case for solitons as well. Um, so, you know, we we we, we certainly take a look. Um, like I, I guess if you uh let me see if I have an example. Um you know, so what what we what we typically do in in this case, like e even for this oh I guess I'm not sli sharing my slides anymore. Um you know, so so what we do is, is certainly, you know, have a range of, you know, bus ring gaps, right? Like um in, in terms of being able to test them just because you know there there are variations in queue that happen um, per per run, um, so what we want to do is be able to kind of cover all of our bases. So um, you know we we have different different ring bus gaps that we we like to explore just so that we 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 are operating in the right regime, um, and it, it's I I guess for um, ring ring gap it, it's it's kind of similar because um, you know you're di different. Strength there also affects the, the the strength of your mode splitting that occurs for normal GVD formation. Um, so you know when when you're starting off with a new device, certainly we want to kind of have a range of those as well, just because you know we don't you know we 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 do our initial modeling to try to understand that, but you know, the, the, the theory doesn't necessarily match up with experiment every single time. So. <laughs> Yeah, one, one, one more question uh, related. For example, uh, this uh, you have just shown that some kind of uh, DWDM transmitters, etc. In those applications, if you you are fiber in fire coupling, or I, I don't think it is a grating coupler, right? In fire coupling, just uh, but coupled fiber, right? Yeah, so we just or, use a for, for input output coupling, a lot of times we use um, a lens fiber. So, you know, we try to match the mode um, of the lens fiber to the, the mode at the, the faceted waveguide. Yeah, so, uh, so those are uh, quite stable, I think, yeah, coupling, yeah. Yeah. So without pigtailing, uh, fiber pigtailing, et cetera, when you continue to experiment, it is relatively stable, you feel, yeah? Yeah, um, lar largely stable. I mean, one, one of the things that, you know, you, you certainly have to initially optimize just because um you know the the when, when you send in a sufficiently high power pump you do see you know thermal thermal expansion if you will right like the the coupling uh changes so uh you want to optimize and certainly i mean i think you can solve a lot of these problems if you can do um you know packaging of the devices where you basically just you know, package the the lens fiber with the with, with the chip. Um, you know, we don't do this for most of our devices just because, you know, we 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 go through so many devices in terms of testing. That it it just doesn't make sense to do the packaging and to make it robust. But you know, there there's been a lot of work to, that people have done on you know making robust packaging as well. So um, that that's I don't think that's fundamental. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, I am. I, uh, so, yeah, thanks, Mr. Yeah. Um, I just had one follow up to the data farm result. Um, so, I noticed that you tried to push in the same data rate across all the home lines. Did you try and maximize that by kind of pushing more data on the lines that have a higher signal to noise? Those are the ones that the oh, are you talking about the, the data comm application? Right. Um, uh, sorry, I, I think I missed the first part of what you you, you mentioned. <laughs> if you can repeat. So that. yeah, I think there were two sets of eye diagrams you showed at ten and sixteen k or something, right? So uh, um, you were using the same data rate on all phone lines. Yeah. I was just curious if you thought about uh, 
given that you work with Karen Bergman, um, mm -hmm. is there a reason to actually be at the same data rate for all phone lines or should we be using higher data rates at the ones which have higher signal to noise in the other phone oh. as opposed to the ones well, that... That's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, in terms of optimization of the, the link, yeah, maybe that's a way to go. I, I, I actually haven't thought about it, so I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, I mean, it, it does make sense. Um, just because, you know, like the, the comb equalization isn't necessarily happening. So I think that's definitely a, uh, 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 something that's worth thinking about. Um, yeah, that's and a, what's that's the company a... that does the packaging for you with the edge company? Oh, you um, mentioned it. This, this was um Optelligent is the, Optelligent. the company that we use for this. So they do packaging for like extra. Do you have to go through AIM to get to them? Or? Oh, that that part I'm not sure. The, this was all you know, like the the transmitter chip development was done all by Karen's group. So that part I'm not sure. Cool. All right, there are no more questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thanks, Yoshi. That was an excellent job. And thanks for your time. And uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Uh, yes, she can give some concluding remarks. And Vijay, if you want to say a word with me. Dr. Sri, are you there? Anyway, I think, uh, yeah, thank you once again, and uh, thank you all uh, the audience for putting uh, so much question, interesting questions. I think uh, it's a very uh, in interesting session. We enjoyed a lot, and thank you very much See once again for your uh, valuable time so much in the early morning, and uh, hopefully we will keep it up and uh, for future collaboration. And our uh, next webinar speaker is... Uh, yeah, Dr. Vivek Raghunathan, you uh, will be coming up in the first of uh, June, I think. Uh, yeah, so he is a uh, yeah, principal engineer in .com USA. I think he's already in the panel somewhat. Somehow he is keeping himself invisible for today. I think so that he can come up in the next time with. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I see. It is. Okay. Hi, Vivek. Yeah. So I, uh, I, we are expecting. We are just. We will be waiting for your uh, talk. That is what I announced today. So if you, uh, yeah. So that with this, I just uh, uh, thank you once again. We can just uh, conclude. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Then bye bye. Yeah. Yeah.